Well, as I say hello to everybody today, I just uh, had a conversation a couple days ago with my Aunt Marie, who lives in Mansfield, and I went to visit her brother who was in the hospital, and she said, Bill, I don't know how you keep up with having three churches. And I said, I don't have three churches. I just have one church with different locations. And then I, I shared that with Peter Wood, and he told me about a young man at the mall congregation. One of the kids said, Pastor Bill must be rich because he's got three churches. So I just wanted you to know that I am very rich because of that. I do feel rich, but maybe not necessarily in a monetary way. I feel blessed to have all you folks with me, and especially the people that are worshiping with us right now at Watkins Glen and the Mall. Let's welcome them, shall we? We are today beginning a series of five teachings or messages on the five practices of fruitful Christian discipleship. And I base this on a book by Bishop Robert Schnazy, he's a bishop in Missouri, and he actually talked about the five practices of fruitful congregations. And so I've kind of adapted uh, Bishop Schnazy's message to include the practices that he, he mentioned and develop them as they apply to us. So five practices of fruitful Christian discipleship. Today, I'd like to talk about radical hospitality. And um, when I talk about this, I'm thinking about our personal lives, being hospitable, as well as our corporate church life. So uh, I'd like to read from Jesus' teaching about fruitfulness in John chapter 15. I'm going to read the first five verses, and then you'll see verse 6 there in your notes. And when I get to verse 6, I'm giving you a little background or context. Then we're going to read verse 6 together, okay? Jesus' teaching. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener, Jesus says. He cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned for greater fruitfulness by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful apart from me. Jesus said, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, I and I in them, will produce much fruit. Now would you read verse 6. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. And so as I, when I read those verses, I think of uh, a few months ago, um, Going from Watkins up to our place at the lake on the west side of Seneca Lake, there's a gazillion acres, it seems like, of grapevines. And you, you would see people out there in January and February working in the vines. You might want to say, well, what are they doing out there in that time of year? They're pruning. The sap is out of the, the vine, and they're pruning the branches and taking away all the extraneous little runners and things so that the branches will be all the more fruitful. And I think about... Um, watching them pruning those vines and how God does that in our life so that we can produce fruit with our lives. So the mission of Jesus' church is to make fruitful Christian disciples. Fruitful Christian discipleship uh, involves our stewardship, if you will, our five practices of discipleship. And the first one that we're going to look at today is radical hospitality. And hospitality, I would suggest, is the, the on-ramp to the Christian life. It's the on-ramp to church. And um, next week, we're going to be looking at the uh, practice of passionate worship and following that intentional faith development. And then the fourth, seri fourth message in the series, extravagant generosity. And then fifth, risk-taking mission and service. On your Let's Connect card, this week, there's a place for you to check on the back. Yes, Pastor Bill, count me in. I want to participate with you in exploring these five practices of fruitful Christian discipleship. As we looked uh, just now, we mentioned the fourth one is extravagant generosity. I'd like to invite uh, Sean and Brandy Terry to come up here right now. Well, I'm uh, excited to have my friends Sean and Brandy Terry with us here uh, for this opportunity to hear about their a bit about their spiritual growth, and uh, this is part of our and lead up time anticipation of Consecration Weekend, which comes up uh, the third weekend of May. But uh, Sean 
and Brandy have been uh, increasingly involved in our church. Uh, Brandy's been with us about 10 years, and Sean, five. And I got to do their wedding um, five years ago this summer. Was it July, August? July. June? June? Come on, when was it? <laughs> July. July what, Brandy? Oh, take two. <laughs> Can you... Uh, <laughs> They were married on July 21st, year 2012, and I know they really know that. But uh, when, when I uh, first met Sean, he was not Mr. Churchgoer by any means, and it's been exciting to watch his faith come alive and to watch Brandy grow in her faith too. Now I'm going to just turn this over, I think, first to Brandy and then to Sean. Thank you, Pastor Bill. Um, it's really an honor to be asked to speak at all of our campuses today. You have to see me on the big screen. Um, like Pastor Bill said, I did start coming to church here at Pennsylvania Ave about 10 years ago. Um, and when I started coming, I really had nothing. Um, I had made a lot of really bad decisions in my life. And when I was invited to church by Sue, um, I was really just starting over and I knew that I needed a support system. Um, some of you who were here back then will remember the five long years we prayed until Sean finally started coming to church for more than just Christmas and Easter. Um, for most of those 10 years, though, we gave or I gave sporadically or not at all sometimes. Um, we gave what we could when we could, and there was no real commitment to it. Um, I know that we didn't always make tithing a priority. Um, there were more bills than there was money, and tithing got skipped whenever there wasn't enough. Last year, I opened my own business um, to make some extra income to help out at home. And when I opened it, the first thing that I committed was that I was going to tithe no matter what on that income. Um, and from day one, God has really blessed my business in ways that we never could have imagined. Uh, in July of last year, there were some things that happened and I was unexpectedly out of work at my full-time job. And because of the business, we haven't had to worry about it. Um, we all, you know, we never worried about where the money was going to come from to pay the bills. And there's been more than enough. And we've been able to give over our tithe as well. We helped a family in need at Christmas. We've been able to give to missionaries and special offerings whenever we wanted to. Um, not only has giving changed our financial life, but I know that it's changed my spiritual life as well. I didn't realize that not giving had created a barrier between God and I. I was still trying to be in control of that part of my life instead of giving it over to God. When I finally gave in and let God have my debit card, um, my personal relationship with him really deepened. This winter, we took Financial Peace University, and we've started working toward being debt-free. Um, we're going to live like no one else now so that we can live and give like no one else later. Uh, the only thing I really wanted to talk about was when me and Brandy first got together, uh, she had her own apartment. Uh, she had a full-time job, but didn't pay very well. Um, really, the first six months to a year I was dating her, I really didn't understand how she was giving the money she was giving to church. It just didn't seem like the bills and her paychecks and tithing added up, but it just seemed like every time there was a struggle or something really hard for her to get through, she just seemed to come into money. Um, I'm not really sure how to describe it or how to explain it, but it was uh, really awesome to be on this side of it before I was uh, into church and uh, going regularly to see this literally happening right before my eyes. Thank you, Sean and Randy, for being willing to share this part of your faith journey. Let's thank them right now, shall we? Our memory verse this week has to do with hospitality, and it's from Romans 15. We've been in John 15. Now I've switched over to Romans chapter 15. And again, before we read that memory verse, which is 15 verse 7, I'd like to give you a little context. I'm going to read a couple verses before that. Romans 15, beginning with verse 5. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you to live in complete harmony with each other each with the attitude of Christ Jesus toward the other. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's read verse 7. This is our memory verse. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And where is that? Romans fifteen seven. 
Radical hospitality is the way in to the church. It's the on-ramp, as I said. Now, radical, um, this is Bill's primitive definition of radical. Uh, write in the blank there, would you? Velcro. And I have a piece of Velcro right here. And Velcro, uh, I did a little Google research on my phone and discovered that it was developed back, I think, in 1955 by a, a Frenchman who'd been out hunting. And he got into the burdocks, he and his hunting dog. And they came back in after hunting, and those annoying burdocks were on both his clothing and the dog's fur. And he pulled one off his clothes, and he looked at it under a microscope, and he described that Velcro has a bunch of little loops on one, hooks on one side and loops on the other. And the way it works is they connect with each other. Now, I've got my, f <laughs> my phone here that I laid next to a pen, and I picked up the pen. My phone will sit right here, and I can just do that. And that's a good thing because before I put the Velcro on the back of my phone, I dropped it and I got yet one more crack in the, the screen here. So don't drop your phone, let me just tell you that. But Velcro is a, a nifty thing that I, I was talking to somebody about it and they said that, that was developed by NASA, wasn't it? Actually, no, this guy developed it, but NASA found a great use for it. When, when they're weightless in space, they can put anything they want and it sticks right there. And so... Our radical hospitality is a Velcro kind of hospitality, if you will. Um, I already gave a shout out to our friends at Fresh Start Mall, but they're the ones that I have called Velcro Christians because I marveled when they started their faith community there in the fall of 2012, almost five years ago. I, I loved it when people would go one time and they're going to, I'm just going to check out these people that meet in the movie theater. And they would go and they'd be stuck. Now, Velcro is not super glue. I mean, you're not glued there where you can't get away, but you, you come up against people and they love Jesus and they have that hospitality and you just want to be part of that and you're stuck. And so um, let's give another shout out to our Velcro Christians at the Fresh Start Mall campus. And it was that kind of radical Velcro hospitality that really inspired me to think that when we started at Watkins Glen, that uh, things won't be exactly the same. It's a movie theater, but there's a lot of things that are different. But one thing that we can take with us is that hospitality, that we have Velcro Christians at Watkins, too. Let's acknowledge them right now, too. And, and when you come, it, it's not just Pastor Bill's sermon. It's probably in spite of his sermon, but it's the Velcro hospitality, that radical kind of hospitality now, at the risk of showing my scientific ignorance, because I have Sarah in my audience right now, um, I'm thinking of uh, chemistry or biology and free radicals. And as I understand, I'm looking at Sarah for affirmation, radicals, uh, as I understand it, are uh, molecules that are highly reactive because they have an uneven pair of, of uh, what's that word? Uh, electrons, that's the word, yeah. And they're just looking to hook on to something. And so the reason that we, uh, we take antioxidants is because it's those uh, radicals in our body that can cause a cancer to grow. And the, the uh, antioxidants help put those radicals, those, those uh, electrons to, to a, a pairing so they're not always grabbing. Is that halfway right, Sarah? She said it was pretty close. Okay, thank you. So we are to be radical Christians in the Velcro sense or in that sense where somebody comes and they have a need, we can, uh, in a loving Christian way, uh, latch on to them and encourage them. Um, hospitality, the dictionary defines as friendly and generous reception of guests, visitors, or strangers in a warm, friendly, and generous way. Parenthesis, I put guest friendliness. We're, we're friendly to guests. We help people to feel accepted and comfortable and loved as they come around our Christian family. And so my hope as a church, at whichever location, whichever faith community, whether it's the mall or Watkins or one of our faith communities, Saturday night or Sunday morning at Pine City, uh, that we might be Velcro Christians, that we might offer that radical kind of hospitality. Because the truth is, and I say this in your notes, the church is the only organization 
which exists for those who are not yet members. Please write that down. People that are not yet with us, we exist for them. That's who we're called to be. Now, we have the uh, PAUMC players who are going to come up and help me give a little demonstration right now. We have before you the PAUMC players who volunteered. They are highly skilled actors and actresses. Well, maybe just one actor. But um, <laughs> they, they represent a church that's closed to outsiders. They don't understand what hospitality is about. Now, I'm going to try to break into this circle, this holy huddle, if you will. They're not, oh, I got an elbow. <laughs> <laughs> Give me your dirty look, Meg. Oh, yeah, here we go. Oh, man. Just can't get it. Oh, man, they, they're good actors. Okay. Now, we're going to break right there and ask them to turn outward. That wasn't <laughs> oh, now, wait a minute. <laughs> so now, theoretically, they're open to outsiders, and they're practicing radical hospitality. So if I go up to them, they're going to welcome me and invite me in, okay? So here we go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just feel part of this family here. All right. Okay. Let's thank our PAUMC players. Yay. Our, back to your, your, uh, your message notes. Our faith communities, our campuses, are to be schools for love. I'm reminded of something that occurred in the second century A.D., uh, at that time, it was uh, Christians were underground. It was Christians were persecuted, and, and they had to worship uh, in secret. But the emperor uh, Caesar Hadrian knew they existed, and he sent one of his uh, his slaves or his servants named Aristides to go spy out those Christians. And Aristides found his way into one of the secret Christian meetings. And he came back and reported to his emperor. He said, behold how they love each other. That was the impression that he got. Even though he was spying on them, they welcomed him and embraced him. And he sensed their love for each other and how that love included him as well. So our faith communities are to be schools or maybe you could say incubators for Christian love. We're supposed to practice that kind of love so that when people take the on-ramp, if you will, into our Christian church, into our faith community. They want what we have. Um, Bishop Schnazy made these statements in the book that I mentioned. Uh, would you read the three phrases with me that you have in your notes, okay? People need to know God loves them, that they are of supreme value, that their life has significance. That's our hope is that will people, when they come, will know that God loves them, that they are very valuable and that their life is significant because of God's love. That sums up, I think, radical hospitality. To develop such a culture of radical hospitality takes practice. Please write that down, practice. Are you a practicing Christian? You know, I, I've heard the expression in the past of a practicing Catholic. I think that means you show up for Mass. But uh, a practicing Christian is one who practices radical hospitality. Um, that Jesus said that if he be lifted up, he will draw all men and women to himself. We want to lift up Jesus Christ in such a loving environment that people will be drawn to want him, that they'll want what we have, and that is that Christian community, that hospitality. John Wesley taught about the way God's grace works in our lives and a distinctive understanding that we Methodists have because of our founder, John Wesley, is that God's grace can be demonstrated in three forms or three ways. And uh, before I go into this, let me first of all ask, any of you grow up in an era where uh, you had a porch on your house, a front porch? Anybody have a front porch? And uh, there used, that was a, an, a bygone era, it seems like, today. Now, if you have a porch, it might be just a couple steps up to the house, and uh, most people don't have porches anymore. I grew up uh, visiting my grandmother in Mansfield, Pennsylvania, and her street was every house had a big front porch. And you'd kind of you'd sit out there in the evenings in the summer, 
and you'd wave to your neighbors or you'd go visiting their porch and the next porch and the next porch. And there was that porch culture, you know, that uh, was inviting and you were, you were inviting. Nowadays, we have what they call a cocoon society where you, uh, in most suburbs today, you go in with your remote garage door opener and you click the door up and you drive in and you put the door down and anything that you have geared toward the outdoors is out back. It's your backyard. It's the patio. Maybe it's an enclosed patio, but it's not geared toward community. We're called uh, to go back to the porch era, and John Wesley knew what a porch was about because he referred to the first kind of grace as prevenient grace. And one time he likened that to, to going on the porch of a house. So write down the word porch there, would you? Uh, prevenient grace is the kind of grace that goes before. It precedes your faith. It's the uh, prevenient can mean preventing. The things that, boy, you think back of your life and the mistakes you made and you're so grateful that, that, that you didn't get further off track than you did. Um, the porch is the welcome symbol for people. The prevenient grace is God preceding your coming to faith. It's for the unconverted, pre-Christian, not yet believer. Uh, it precedes their decision to become a follower of Christ to the point of their personal acceptance of the gospel. But prevenient grace is that porch or that front porch hospitality that can uh, be conducive and helpful for people to come to faith. And that's what prevenient grace meant for Wesley. And then he describes a second kind of grace, which is uh, justifying grace. And justification uh, is when you make that decision. Uh, justification, Billy Graham said, is, uh, it could be defined just as if I never sinned. You make that commitment to Christ and you're forgiven. And you have a new relationship to Jesus. And that word is doorway. Please write down the word doorway. It's the doorway into the household of God's salvation. The doorway into faith. Um, a memory verse a few weeks back was John 1, 12. As many as received him, to them gave he the opportunity to become children of God. We've become a child of God when we step from the porch through the doorway. And, and that's that uh, clear milestone in our life. When I used to be a non-believer, and now I've come to put my faith in Christ. Uh, we find our identity in Christ all of a sudden. So we're moving from the front porch hospitality prevenient grace to actually coming to experience Christ in our life. And that's that um, wonderful opportunity we have to really be sure that we have a faith in Jesus Christ. Um, on the back of your Let's Connect card is a place where you can say, I am deciding today to become a believer and follow Jesus Christ. That's the doorway. That's where you come to that point of justifying grace. So we have the porch, which is prevenient grace, the doorway, which is justifying grace, and then sanctifying grace, write down the word house. That's the, uh, the household of God. Sanctifying is based on the word sanctus in the Latin, and it means that you're becoming more and more uh, a believer, more and more belonging to Christ. Sanctification, um, I made this word up, I think. It's, I, I call it holification, where you're becoming more holy all the time. Um, as I like to ask you sometimes, are you willing to give as much of yourself as you can to as much of Jesus Christ as you can understand. And when you do that, you're being sanctified. You're, it's a continual process. We never arrive. Uh, Wesley talked about going on to perfection, being made perfect in love. Um, that's, uh, that's the growing up aspect of our faith. So we go from prevenient grace to justifying grace to the rest of our life encompass, encompasses sanctifying grace to become more holy, completely Jesus Christ. Now, going back to what I talked about early on about pruning, that's where pruning takes place a lot of times. The, uh, Jesus says he is the vine, we are the branches. His father is the vine dresser or the gardener, the one who prunes us. And the Lord prunes us and sanctifies us and makes us more uh, more the Lord's so that we can produce the fruit 
of discipleship. Having said this much about radical hospitality, let me ask you this. How are you doing? How are you doing personally offering radical hospitality to the people in your life? How are you doing as a faith community? Each of your faith communities who I'm speaking to today, um, consistency is so very important. Um, a pastor friend of mine made this point, and I really was struck by this. He says, you know, if we get it right three out of four Sundays in a month, that's not good enough. If people are going to feel free to invite their friends or their friends, friends, relatives, associates, neighbors, kids, Frank, if they're going to invite Frank to church, they have to be confident that the people they invite are going to have a consistent, consistently excellent hospitality. We can't get it right three weeks and then blow it the fourth week. So whether it's technology or it's the coffee hour or it's every aspect of all that we offer, we want to offer as much excellence as we can. Good enough is not enough. Three out of four is not good enough. They need to see Jesus in us consistently week to week. Now, uh, a, a quote from John Wesley um, says this, While the grace of God is undivided, grace precedes salvation as prevenient grace. Grace continues in justifying grace and is brought to fruition in sanctifying grace. Do you see how this all works together? We, we go from uh, grace that goes before, and we, we finally take that step from the porch through the doorway, and then we have the rest of our lives to be the best of our lives, to explore God's household and all the riches that he has for us. That's who we're called to be. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you that you call us to uh, fruitful Christian discipleship, and we want to be the real deal, Lord. We want to offer that kind of radical hospitality that is a, a magnet for people, that they want what we have, and they want to grow with us to go on to perfection. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.